Today on The Girl Defined Show, we are talking about masturbation. Masturbation is something that I actually actually struggled with a lot as a single woman. And for me, it was very much driven by lust. It was driven by fantasy. And in my heart, I knew what I was doing wasn't honoring to God. I knew it wasn't in his design for me and pursuing purity and holiness, but I didn't know how to break free as a single woman. I didn't know how to understand my body. I didn't know how to embrace God's design for my sexuality. I didn't understand how to truly pursue purity as he intended. And I know as I've talked to so many of you, you have the same questions. And now as a married woman, I have more questions on the other side of marriage regarding my sexual design. And so in today's episode, we are going to be talking about all of that, masturbation, how to think about it as a married woman, as a single woman. What does God's word say about this? How do we embrace God's design for our sexuality without falling into any of the ditches? We're going to dive into all of that today on The Girl Defined Show. What's up, y'all? It's Bethany and Kristen here, and I am really excited for this conversation on masturbation. I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems that Christian women particularly are very silent on this topic, and I think that's why when you and I, Kristen, post and talk about masturbation from like a biblical lens, the comments, the DMs, the click rate on those posts like skyrocket. It's insane, and I think it's because we as Christian women are desperate for information about our sexuality, about our struggles, about what, like, what does the Bible say is, you know, a right uh, living out of our sexuality? What is against God's design? Like, we just have so many questions and it can be so hard to yeah. find answers. And we all know going to good old Google can bring up some real sketchy stuff. And so most of us don't really want to Google like, oh, my struggle with masturbation because we're like, I don't know what's going to pop up. And I I don't really want to go to secular sources. I want someone who's going to take me to scripture, but it can be hard. So here we are. And really what triggered this conversation is we actually just released a guide um, a digital download on the topic of masturbation. The The guide is called find, Finding Freedom from Masturbation, Gospel Strategies for Walking in Victory. And as you can see, this ebook, this PDF download is for the woman who is like, wow, this, I am kind of like trapped in this, or this is a habit I've had that I just really want to break. I know this isn't honoring to the Lord. Um, This is something that is filled with like lust and fantasy. And I just, I know this is not where I want to be. Like I want to break free from this sin. I want helpful strategies. That's what we created, finding freedom for masturbation for, for the single or married woman for you to get for a friend. And just to be bold about this topic and say, I'm not going to let, you know, Satan trap me in this in my own little island and, and keep this secret all to myself. Like I am going to confess this to the Lord. I'm going to find a mentor, someone to help me walk through this. I'm going to get this guide. I'm going to start taking those steps. So this guide is actually available right now at girldefined.com slash shop. We'll link it directly below so you can go straight there. But yeah, we're excited. I have um, a lot of uh, you know, anonymous questions, DMs that came in over the past weekend that we're going to, we're going to unpack. This is not going to be your typical conversation on masturbation, right, Kristen? <laughs> oh no. Well, and it's so interesting because when we released our PDF, I think we were even blown away by how many people oh were gosh, yeah. not only purchasing it, but DMing us, like you said, emailing us and having follow-up questions. And, you know, is this something I should get? Or I have questions as a married woman, or I'm a single Christian yeah. woman. Here's my struggle. Will this relate to me? Will this help me? Just so many nuances. Is, right. And I think yes. we were even kind of blown away because this isn't the first time we've ever talked about this. We've had, I, re, I had an episode specifically on masturbation that came out a while ago, sharing my whole journey, my struggle, my journey to freedom, what that looked like. And then we've talked about this. We have a whole section in our book, Sex, Purity, and the Longings of a Girl's Heart. We have an entire section on this as well. And we've talked about it in other ways, just, just on Instagram. And so it's not the first time, but we've never released a resource that was specifically just about masturbation and finding freedom. And so clearly there is a chord being struck here. This is resonating. This is something that we see as a Christian community, women saying, I need this. I want this. I'm confused about this, or I'm struggling with this, or I have questions about this and I need answers. And sadly, when you look out at the Christian resource, (laughs) what's available out there, there isn't a ton of resources on this specific topic, specifically addressed to women. There are a lot of resources, I think, for men because oftentimes sexual struggles sadly can be viewed more as a man's issue and a man's topic. But as women, we know we are just as sexual as men. We are also created as sexual beings and God has a beautiful design for our sexuality, but we're also broken because of the fall, because of sin. And so we wrestle and we struggle and we need more resources for women helping us link arms, journey together to feel like I'm not alone. I'm not on an island. My struggles don't have to remain a secret. I can bring 
bring them into the light. I can get help. And that is exactly why we created this resource so that we can come alongside you and say, you're not alone. Let's go on this journey together. Yes. Oh my goodness. 100%. So I think it would be helpful though, if we start with some definitions, because that's what I have found in this conversation that people are very confused. Like, what are we Mm -hmm. talking about? And many of us, we think, oh, if I say the word masturbation, here's exactly what I'm talking about. But if you got 10, 10 of us as women in the same room, we might all have different definitions. So I think it would be helpful for us to kind of like lay the foundation. Let's get some clarity on exactly what we're talking about when we use the word masturbation. Um, I don't have the dictionary yeah, definition. In front I of have it pulled up. You've got it. Okay. Yeah. So according to the dictionary, <laughs> here is how masturbation is defined. The stimulation or manipulation of one's own genitals, especially to orgasm, sexual self-gratification. And I think that is a very basic very helpful yeah. to definition to just say, okay, as we approach this topic in this conversation right now, that is the working definition that I would say we're going off of. That is how we would define masturbation in this conversation. So I'm going to read it one more time. So if you missed it, you can really hear what we're saying here. The stimulation or manipulation of one's own genitals, especially to orgasm, sexual self-gratification. And in a minute, we are going to get into breaking down some nuances of how this could play out in for married women and for single women, because something that I think we have made the mistake of here in our conversations, even um, as a ministry, is that we haven't been super clear on kind of drawing a line and having this discussion for married women and how that might impact and look different within a marriage covenant relationship between a husband and wife versus a single woman who was unmarried yeah. um, and God's call for a Christian single woman and her sexuality and God's call for a married woman and her sexuality. There are yeah. distinctions. There are differences, clearly, because um, we know sex was designed for marriage. We're going to get into that. So in this conversation, we're going to break into some of those nuances that we haven't touched yeah. on before. And a lot of this was spurred on because so many of you were asking questions questions as married women and as single women. So we want to talk to each group today. And I think that's going to be really helpful. Yeah, for sure. And I think part of that is our ministry really did start as a ministry for single women. So our audience has been very clear. So in past conversations, we've very much been talking to single women. But as our ministry has grown, as Kristen and I have gotten married and had babies, and our ministry has just evolved, and we have a ton of married women now. Like It's kind of you know, 50, 50, we've got like 50% married women, 50% single women. And so there's, there's no way to have a conversation just to, you know, like to say, here's, here's something. And this applies to everyone in this context. So I'm really excited. If you are single, we are going to have a segment specifically for you in this conversation. And then married women, all of those nuances, those questions you have, we are going to give you some answers, but I think it's important to note that, um, the word masturbation is not found in scripture. So that's why we went to the dictionary (laughs) to find our definition. And I think that's part of the reason it can be a little bit scary to talk about this because we do not want to add to scripture in any way. We do not want to um, speak for scripture in in ways it does not speak. And so my hope is that by the end of this conversation, you'll actually see the freedom and the beauty of God's design and you won't, won't live in fear, but you'll be able to know, hey, this is God's good design and his boundaries for me in different seasons. And I can thrive in that. And outside of what he clearly says is um, honoring to him or not honoring to him, sin or not, I'll know how to walk in freedom. And I think that that's the beauty of this conversation is less of, um, okay, we just want to bring the hammer on anyone who's struggling. Like, no, we Christ has set us free. We can find freedom mm-hmm. in him and we can walk in freedom. We can enjoy um, as married women intimacy in the right context. As single women, you, we, can, we can use our lives in such incredible ways. And so I think that you're going to walk away today and just go, wow, like I am excited for the season I'm in. I have practical strategies to combat sin. I have practical strategies to know how to live out my sexuality well. Like, I just think this is going to be a really freeing conversation. You know, I wish that when I was younger, when I was a single woman, I wish that I had had more of a biblical gospel-centered framework for understanding God's design for sexuality. Because as I wrestled in my own struggles with masturbation, and like I said in the intro, for me, they were definitely very lust-fueled and fantasy-driven. They were not... um, I knew it wasn't a pure act. I knew it wasn't, as a Christian single woman, I knew it wasn't honoring to God. Um, And I knew his call for me was holiness. And I, you know, I knew sex was for marriage and sexual acts, but I didn't, I didn't have that greater, more beautiful picture. And so for me, there was a lot of shame of just like, like, 
how come I can't stop? I didn't feel like I had the tools. I didn't have that greater understanding. And so for me, it was so much of like, I just need to stop this, but I didn't really have anything I was aiming for, like that bigger, more beautiful picture. And so let's just give that recap because I think it is so important. Like that is foundational, whether you're single, married, whether you're ever going to get married or whether you've already been married for a while, like we need these reminders. We need to go back to the Bible and understand that God is the author of sex. It wasn't something Hollywood invented. (laughs) It wasn't, you know, it's like, this was actually God's design. And if we take a moment to like, so like, let that soak in, we'll realize that God is for pleasure, that he created sexual intimacy, that he, this thing that can sometimes even feel like a dirty word in the church is something our holy and pure and awesome God actually invented himself. And so it's not something we have to be afraid of. It's not something we have to be hush hush shy about. It's something that in our singleness, in marriage, in any stage of life, we need to understand God's design for this biblically, what it was created for and how to embrace it rightly. So going back to Genesis, this is when we see first glimpses of sexual intimacy Mm -hmm. entering the scene, right? Genesis 1 and 2, we see this beautiful picture of God creating the world, of God creating the man first. So you see the male come on the scene, and then you see God giving the man. He's fully sexual. He is a full-grown man. He's not a child. He's not a baby. He is a 100% full-grown man with all the parts. Like God made him that way. That's how he came into this world. He was fully sexual. Yes, everything. But he was alone. And while he was alone, God gives him responsibilities. God is setting up some of these beautiful compliments gender distinctions. We see this in Genesis. It's a beautiful thing. God giving him roles, responsibilities, helping him learn how to be a leader, how to embrace that rightly. And then God brings along this woman who is a full-grown woman. She comes from the man, right? From the rib. It's incredible. She's part of him. That symbolizes that unity that they have, that oneness. Like She literally came from his body. She is fully woman. She is not a child. She is not an adolescent. She is a full-grown woman with all the hormones, all the estrogen, all of the sex drive, all of that. She's fully woman, fully developed. And I'm sure Adam was just like, whoa, this is a good day when she came on the scene. So here well, you have he two. Say, just, let me just read it because it's Genesis 2, 23. This is what he says. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken from the man. And then the two verses, let me just read these real quick and then you keep going. But Genesis 2, um, 24 says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Speaking of togetherness, they are united. They are sexually together. They are one. Um, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Like, y'all, this is in the Bible. Like, this is the very beginning. This is before there was any sin. God is saying that they become one flesh. They're both naked. There's no shame. Like, this beautiful sexual relationship, even before the fall. Like, that's crazy that sex was a part of God's good design for his perfect creation. Yes, it wasn't something that came after the fall. Like, okay, now you're sexual beings and it's this dirty, bad thing that happened after sin entered the world. No, it was there. And in fact, it was the most beautiful, perfect version of sex that the world has ever known because it wasn't distorted by sin. There was no impact of sin on their relationship yet. There was no shame. There was no deceptiveness. There was no, like they were 100% vulnerable and intimate and open and it was beautiful and perfect in every way. And oh man, I think every married woman would say, wow, amen to that. Like I wish we could go back to that place, but we can't. And one day God will restore and make all things new. But so here we have it, Adam and Eve, this perfect, beautiful relationship, completely sexual. And it, like you said, it was a part of God's original design, be fruitful and multiply. You know, they were naked and unashamed. Like they were intimate. They were one. Like this is a picture of sex and it's such a beautiful thing. And we see what God is doing here. He didn't just throw sex into the world, give us all sex drives, make us sexual, and then be like, figure it out. Like just whatever you're, you know, almost almost animalistic, like just follow your sex drive to its end. No, God actually had beautiful parameters, Mm -hmm. beautiful boundaries, a beautiful setting, a place where sex could thrive. You know, just like a fish thrives in water, you take it out, it struggles, and then eventually does it make it. It's like sex is set within a beautiful parameter where God is saying, this is where this beautiful, intimate, most vulnerable act that you would ever have as a human, this nakedness, this is its place to thrive in a relationship between a husband and wife in this covenant, this lifelong union between a man and a woman, something else that has become very confused in our society today. We see God clearing up so much of the confusion right there in Genesis 1 and 2, giving us this picture. And so that is the framework for all of us as Christian women to say, 
okay, God had a plan. God had a purpose. God isn't holding out on me in singleness. God isn't trying to withhold pleasure from me on purpose because he wants to punish me or squash me. He didn't give me the sex drive and then say it's only for marriage because he hates me. Like, no, God designed all of us as sexual beings and then had a plan and purpose so that in marriage, it would draw a husband and wife together. It would become a celebration of that covenant. It would become an act that unifies the husband and wife, something that brings them together, something that can also create children, a beautiful gift within marriage, Mm -hmm. family, like so many blessings, so many gifts, so much intentionality. But you see when you take sex outside of marriage, you rip it out of that covenant, you rip it out of that union, you rip it out of that place for intimacy, for vulnerability, for family, for all these things. Things, that is when so much of the brokenness, so much yeah. of the confusion, so much of the heartache, so much of the sin, the impact, that is when it happens. And so as Christian women, we need to get this framework right, that God is a good God, a good father, and he plans things intentionally on purpose for our good and for our thriving and for his glory. And so getting back to this mm-hmm. picture and saying, God, I trust you. I believe you. Help me to understand more about this design and to uphold the beauty of your design that you created. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because although a lot of our world doesn't acknowledge God, his design um, really infiltrates like we are all image bearers and we are his creation, whether we acknowledge it or not. And so I, the like a few months ago, I was like, you know, I want to hear like for Christian, I mean, not for Christian, for secular women, women who don't, do not acknowledge God, who do not hold to any specific religion or anything. What are the experts in that realm saying about intimacy and and who are, you know, how to find sexual satisfaction? So I listened to an insanely popular podcast for women and it's one of like, it's just a very, very popular podcast. And the reason I chose it is because she had a, a female sex therapist on. And so I was like, I just want to hear this conversation and hear what kind of questions um, non-religious women are asking and what advice this secular sex therapist is giving. And what was super fascinating is that one... Secular women are asking very much the same questions that um, Christian women are asking, but the advice that this secular sex therapist gave, she was saying that truly the best sex, the best intimacy happens when you are in a long-term committed relationship. She didn't say marriage, but she just said when you're in a long-term committed relationship where you can communicate, where you can feel safe, where you can feel free to grow and to express. And I'm like, they, you know, they're not putting that in the context of marriage. They're just saying like, uh, you know, a safe, committed relationship. But like, whoa, where did that come from? Like, why is that where sexual intimacy thrives and grows and women feel free to express themselves and, and you know, blossom in their sexuality? It's because God designed it that way in the beginning. Like you just said, back in Genesis, God has a good design. So as much as we try to pull away from that as a world and kind of like as a society, it's amazing that the experts out there, apart from pointing to God, are saying, hey, in a committed relationship, this is where sex thrives. And they're they're advising secular women saying, hey, if you want to be a sexually thriving woman, you need to be in a committed relationship. I just thought that was crazy that so yes. much of our world points back to God, even if we don't acknowledge him, you know? I love when secular theory, secular therapists or science, (laughs) when it completely backs up God's design, which happens again and again, because it just shows like God knew what he was doing. He has a plan. So this begs the question, if sex is designed for marriage, there are all sorts of other sexual acts, sexuality. So maybe moving into this conversation about how one, how seriously God takes this because he, one one thing that we didn't touch on, God takes this very seriously because sex isn't just about the pleasure, the covenant of marriage. It is actually an earthly representation of God's relationship with his people, with his church. God gave us marriage the covenant between a man and a woman, and then sexual intimacy to be a reflection. It's a metaphor. We see this in Ephesians 5 of an earthly picture for humans to look at and say, it's a broken picture because of sin, but it is it is giving us a glimpse of what God's relationship is like with his church, of the husband reflecting Christ, the groom. The wife is the reflection of Christ's church, the bride. And sexual intimacy is a picture of the deep knowing, the yada. We've talked about yeah. that word. It means a deep knowing of someone else. And that is a word that God uses in scripture to talk about the deep knowing that he wants to have with his children in a relationship. It's not sexual at all when it comes to God and us. It's a deep knowing, an intimacy, relationship that God is saying, I love you. I sent my son to die for you. 
he is coming back for the church to redeem things once and for all. And marriage is an early representation to constantly remind us of that covenant keeping God, that God who says, I love you so much. I pursued you. Um, I am in covenant with my church. It is a promise that I will never break. That is what marriage is supposed to represent, reflecting that covenant that God has with his people. And so that is why God takes it so seriously. That is why in scripture, you might feel like, wow, God is awfully heavy handed when it comes to verses about sexual immorality or, you know, keeping the marriage bed pure or like, you know, things like that. Like I'm just, you know, single. Is it really that big of a deal if I mess around? You know, if I act out sexually in my singleness, like it's not really hurting anyone. Well, that's because we're missing this bigger picture that it's, it's a representation of a covenant of God's relationship to his church. And so God is very protective of that. It's a very holy thing. It's something that God wants us to get right because it matters so much. It actually reflects on the gospel, right? Like it's, if we have a distorted view of sexuality, we're probably going to have a distorted understanding of the gospel because it's all interconnected. And so God is not heavy handed in the sense that he doesn't want us to experience joy. He wants us to understand how awesome this covenant is, the greater picture that it represents. That's why he wants us to uphold it in honor, in reverence, to uphold it in holiness because of what it reflects. That's why verses like Hebrews 13, 4 say, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And what God is saying here is that marriage is such an honorable thing because what it represents. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. Like there should be no defiling of that covenant, of that relationship between that man and that woman. And God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous because when we're when we commit adultery in marriage, it is like we are, we're basically painting a wrong picture of God's faithfulness and covenant with us, right? Like in adultery, just as if we as a church, if we strayed and started worshiping idols, we rejected the one true God and we started worshiping other false gods, that would be committing adultery against God. And so God is saying marriage, if you commit adultery, it's like that same picture of the church turning its back on God, rejecting God. And so that's why God takes this so seriously because of the greater picture it represents. And so I think as we move into talking about this for single women, it's very important that we understand God's call for sexual holiness, for purity, is yeah. because he wants us to uphold and have such a deep reverence yeah. for the gospel, for who God is and what that marriage yeah. and sexual act within marriage actually represents. And in our book, Sex, Purity, and the Longings of a Girl's Heart, which you can get on Amazon, you can get on our website, girldefined.com. I highly recommend it. That is a book for single or married women to really help you fully understand this beautiful God-given um, you know, picture of sexuality, why he created you as a sexual being, wrong mindsets to get rid of, um, and just really, you know, really understand it rightly. Uh, but in Sex, Purity, and the Longings of a Girl's Heart, we say you can live without sex, but you can't live without Yada, basically true intimacy with God. And that's the reality. Think of Jesus, our Savior. He came to this world fully God, fully man, and he was not married. He did not have sex, which sounds weird to say, like when you're talking about Jesus. But that's the reality, though. He had a body. He had a fully male body, but he was able to have that intimate relationship with God, non-sexual, but like that deep, all knowing he came to do the will of his father. He was, you know, prayerful and in tune. God, what do you want from me? He had that deep communal relationship with God. And that is a picture of what we all need as humans. Um, you know, we can be, that's why you will see people who, uh, great missionaries in the past, you know, where they were like, you know, trapped in some jail, they obviously clearly weren't, you know, having sex, but they had, they, they were able to maintain a deep all knowing relationship with God and still somehow had joy and purpose in those difficult times. And the reason is because our deepest soul need as humans, it's not what Hollywood tells us. It's not that, okay, if you can just grab that hunk and have the best sex of your life, you're going to be satisfied. <laughs> no, there are a lot of people in Hollywood having all sorts of sex. And there are a lot of people that are truly right. unsatisfied. Same just in the world, you know, they're think about, um, our own selves. You know, you can, you can, be masturbating and doing all the things, but why is there such dissatisfaction? It's because that is not the deepest longing of our heart. Yes, we are sexual beings and that is a beautiful thing, but the the deepest need of our heart is a deep, all-knowing, raw, authentic relationship with Christ where we know him and he knows us and we aren't you know, he he sees all things, but we aren't like trying to keep things from him. We aren't trying to hide. We aren't trying to live in that shame. We're saying, God, thank you for sending your son for me. I want to know you. I want to do your will. And it's crazy that you could live your entire life single. You could live your entire life without ever having sex and truly live a purposeful, mm-hmm. meaningful life 
life. And this ties in a little bit to my story. I know Kristen, you shared a little bit of um, some of your singleness. And for me, I, you know, I thought, well, oh, I can save sex for marriage because I'll probably get married 20, 21, 22. I ended up getting married at 30. And so I had some not, you know, I know there are people who have been single a lot longer than me, but for each of us, it's like, okay, what, what am I going to do with these extra single years? And I will tell you, it was hard for a while when your friends are getting married and you're like, wow, maybe I'm never going to get to experience this gift of intimacy, this gift of sex with a man. And, you know, we're like those like, please, God, don't let the rapture come. Don't have the second return until I can get married. You know, we all have those prayers. <laughs> I know I wasn't the only one. Like, I mean, it's going to be great to be in heaven, yes. but can I please get married first? You know, like we all do that. Um, and yes. so for me, it was coming to this place of God, like, I know you're a good God and I know you have a good plan for my life. So if you do not have marriage in my future, can I live a purposeful, like thriving life? And I'm going to tell you, it took some work. It took some, you know, intentional mentorship with godly women. I had to really dig into the word and evaluate my heart and really grow in this area. But I, I came to this point where I was able to say, you know, God, if you do have me single for the rest of my life, I can thrive in this season. And I'm telling you, I know for some of you, you're thinking, mm -hmm. like, that's impossible. Like, I do not want that. Like, please don't even speak those words. Um, but it is possible. And I'm telling you, the last few years of my singleness, I look back with so much joy and so much like I loved those years of my life uh, because I had really entered into this place of saying, God, I'm here to live for you. And I'm going to embrace these single years with the benefits that come with singleness, like a lot of schedule flexibility, being able to kind of pick up and just go and do, you know, a, a trip or travel or invest in ways into other people that I haven't, you can't, you know, like marriage and mm -hmm. singleness is different. And there are um, differences that single women can embrace that are harder for married women. And so entering into that and saying, wow, how can I use my life, my time, my body in ways that are glorifying to you, but that are fully thriving in this season. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, it <clears throat> is possible, um, not in your own strength. You have to really, really, uh, you know, dig deep into your relationship with Christ, spending time with him, getting mentors, um, really filling your mind with truth um, and getting discipled by godly women, being in a community within your church, those are the things that are going to really help you in that direction. But that's just a word of hope to know that there are single women who have never had sex and who are fully thriving in their you know, relationship with Christ. So I just hope that encourages you a little bit. I'm sure a lot of single women who are listening are feeling encouraged by that hopeful picture of like, wow, that is where I want to get. But I am guessing a lot of them, just like I was for many years, are not in that place yet. And they're in that place of struggle. They're in that place of even wrestling with like, well, you know, masturbation seems like a great way to have a sexual release in my singleness. Um, I know marriage isn't anywhere on the horizon soon. I see this bigger picture of God's design for sex and marriage. It's beautiful. I want to, rev you know, I want to have reverence and respect and uphold that, pursue that, you know, but I'm not there yet. And I have a very strong, so strong sex drive and I'm struggling. And it's something that I just feel like I can't break free from. And so I think this would be a great time to talk specifically to single women who are in that place of struggle and who are even questioning like if it's really a big deal or not. Like I've heard, I've heard this from many single women. I even thought this myself for many years. Like, you know, I know this isn't the best. Like I know it's very lust fueled, fantasy driven. I don't think what's happening is really honoring to God or his covenant for marriage, this like sexual act of masturbation, but is it really hurting anyone? Like, is it really that big of a deal? Does God really care that much? And so I just want to speak to women who, single women specifically, who are in that place because I can relate. I remember thinking so many of those same things. And like I said earlier, I think for me, I didn't have that bigger framework. I wasn't operating from that bigger framework of what is God's design for sex. And I kind of viewed masturbation as like a separate act. Like, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just orgasm. Like it's really not that big of a deal, but it wasn't until I really understood like the holiness of marriage, the, like the intentionality of marriage, how much respect and reverence God had for it. And how, although masturbation is never mentioned in the Bible, I think we could all agree that it is a sexual act. I don't really think there's any other category you can drop masturbation in that it would fit other than the fact that it is a sexual act, right? I mean, you are stimulating your genitals as a single person for orgasm. And so as we think about this and as we think about this act that we're leaning into, although it feels so natural, it feels like it's just such a natural expression of our sex drive. Like I get that hundred percent. We really have to ask these questions, not well, is it a sin? Is it not? I don't see this word in the Bible, so it's not a big deal. But these are some of the questions that we pose in our PDF resource that we created, Finding Freedom from Masturbation, that just released last week. Last week. 
And these are the questions that we should be asking, questions I wish I had known to ask earlier Mm -hmm. in my struggle as a single woman. One, is masturbation in line with God's design and purpose for sex and intimacy? And like we've talked about, sex and intimacy were created for marriage. It wasn't a random act that God gave to all people. It was a celebration of covenant that God gave for a husband and wife. That is where sex was. That's where God placed it. That was his choice. And so as we engage in masturbation, stimulating our genitals to orgasm, is that in line with God's purpose and plan as we see in scripture? We have to be really honest about answering this question. And then number two is, yeah, just to jump in, it's not just saying the, I think it's like most of the time, at least from women I've talked to, it's connected to what the mind is doing as well. So I think it's of course like link those two together. Like what is your mind doing from most women we've heard of? It's a fantasizing about someone that is not their spouse as their master yes. or watching pornography yes. in conjunction mm-hmm. with it. Yeah. And sadly, our society has taken such a hard turn toward embracing all things pornography, erotica. We are told as women, it's completely normal. This is absolutely natural to embrace your sex drive in this way, to orgasm, watching porn, reading erotica, looking at very sexualized pictures. Um, that is all very normalized in our society. So it, I can understand why it might feel like, wow, this seems extreme. But as Christians, we have to remember that we are not called to do things according to the world. We're called to be set apart. We're called to pursue Christ and his glory and to embrace God's design and his plan. And let's remember those studies that Bethany mentioned earlier. Ultimately, even the world oftentimes comes around to realizing that God's way is the better way. Even though they don't say it's God's design, they start living in accordance to it because God's design is one of order. It's one that helps us thrive and bring him glory, whether we even realize it or not. His ways are always right, always good. So yes, the mind and the body are very connected for me. 100% that was true. I could not masturbate without having some sort of lustful Mm -hmm. sexual fantasy going on in my mind. It's like 100% true for me. And I know as I've talked to women, I don't think I've ever met one that's like, no, I just, I read scripture and masturbate and it's great. Like, I don't really think that's happening, you know? So asking these questions is so important. (laughs) Um, Is masturbation an authentic expression of sexual pleasure within marriage? And as single women, we're not even married, right? So there's no way that we can that we can masturbate within a marital relationship to even enjoy pleasure with our spouse. There's no spouse. So there's no intimacy. It's just a solo act of us pursuing pleasure for ourselves. So it cannot be an authentic expression of sexual pleasure within marriage because there's no marriage. And then lastly, does masturbation help me pursue a heart of purity before God? I know for myself, like I said, that it w- it was not helping me. It was not helping me pursue holiness, purity. Even it wasn't helping me pursue satisfaction in my singleness of yeah. God, you've given me this sex drive, but how can I use my energy, my body for your good to serve others for your glory? And in our PDF guide, we break down eight very practical steps that you can take that personally helped me on my journey to eventually finding freedom in my singleness. I did reach a place where I I was able to conquer that sin. And I want I hope that's hopeful for you in your singleness to think, okay, it is possible to get to a place where you can have victory. It doesn't have to be a forever struggle, but it's so important that we get back to the basics of the framework of our understanding of marriage, of sexual intimacy, what honors God, what doesn't, um, purity, holiness in our mind, and then even our bodies and our sex drive and learning how to take all of that pent up energy that we feel like we're just going to explode, like learning how to take that energy and pursue good things for others. I know you mentioned Bethany in your singleness as the more you looked outward, The more you poured into others serving, looked for ways to bless people. Um, Even for me, practical things like exercise, very helpful. Like I've got all this pent up sex drive. Like, okay, I don't just have to sit here and cry about it. Like I can go run, you know, I can go do like a little weight workout or something to just like exert some energy. So just thinking of your body being in tune with your body. And I know Bethany, you've talked a lot about this just on your own Instagram account of like as single women, understanding our sex drive, but understanding God's call and then saying, okay, I've got all this pent up energy. How can I use this to serve others? to be aware of what's going on in my body, um, but to exert this energy in a way that's going to be God honoring. Yeah. I think that's huge because we don't want to become at war with our body. Like God Mm -hmm. created us with bodies. Just like I talked about his, you know, death and resurrection wouldn't have been possible without his body. So the body is important. The body is valuable. I love the work that Nancy Piercy has done, even in her book, Love Thy Body. Um, We've had her on the podcast. Um, Dr. Julie Slattery, she's written a book, um, Sex and the Single Girl. We had her on the podcast. We have an episode. She also kind of talks about this stuff, but it's not becoming at war with your body and saying, okay, 
be, because I struggle with masturbation, I just want to disassociate from my body. And then one day when I get married, I just need to turn the switch and say, okay, now my body's a good thing. Like, don't view your body as the enemy. View it as something right. that beautiful that God gave you that you can use in the right context right now. So like Kristen mentioned, exercising can be such a beautiful thing. And I would encourage you sometimes Mm -hmm. take off the headphones. Don't listen to music, like exercise and notice what your body's doing, like feeling your muscles, feeling how, you know, the sweat feels on your skin, stuff like that can really help you to see the beauty in how God created your body and not make it the enemy. So uh, when I was single, I decided to train for a marathon, which was very extreme. Um, but it really, it was such a great goal and such a great use of my body. And I had the time as a single woman to train for that. So like Kristen mentioned, exercise, that's a great thing that you can do. Another great thing, God designed us in um, to enjoy um, and to appreciate physical contact in non-sexual mm-hmm. ways. So you know if you're someone who has uh, really good friends or you come from a big family, um, just those hugs can release great hormones. And it's you know, studies show that, you know, we should have so many hugs in our day just on in a non-sexual way. So making sure that you're in community, if you don't have family around where you have that non-sexual physical touch, even like volunteering in the nursery at your church, something like that, where you are able to have, or even getting a pet. I mean, there are literally like ways that you can have that connection um, to other living beings that is completely non-sexual, but really helps you to embrace um, God's good design for just connection with others. And so practically looking at your life and saying, are there things that are missing? I mean, I would say, uh, Dr. Julie Slattery mentioned this. She said boredom is a huge reason for single women that they can end up getting into this place of struggling with masturbation because they just don't have enough going on in their life. They don't have enough purpose. They don't have enough to think about. And so they just kind of end up defaulting at night into masturbation. And so making sure that your life has a lot of purpose, that you have direction, that you have a lot going on in a good way. You know, that, like I said, getting involved in your church, getting involved in singles groups, serving, um, making sure that you have have a good, meaningful job, work to do. Like we were created for all of that. Um, And I think the more that you can aim your life towards good things, the easier it's going to be to put Mm -hmm. off those sinful habits. And we're not going to be able to get into all the practical strategies in this podcast. You can go back and listen to Kristen's story. Um, We'll link it below. You can just search on our podcast, Masturbation. We have another episode. But then I would really encourage you, if you are someone you're saying, yes, I am a single woman or a married woman who is struggling with this lust-filled, fantasy-driven, like apart from a covenant, you know, marriage, apart from my spouse, um, I, I need some help. I need some freedom. I definitely recommend grabbing the guide that is for sure for you. So we'll link up below. Go to girldefined.com slash shop. But I do want to have a quick word to the married women, Kristen. We yes. promised them we would talk to them. Yep. So we've got married to. Married women, here we are. <laughs> yes. Well, married women fall in such a different camp because you fall within the category of people who are within a covenant relationship where sexual intimacy is not only encouraged in the Bible, but it's celebrated. It's right and good. We have an entire book called The Song of Solomon, which I know most of us are well aware of, where it is a beautiful book highlighting the sexual intimacy between a husband and wife, painting this incredible picture of intimacy, a pleasure, of arousal, of pursuing, of all of the body parts. Like It is a very explicit, very beautiful picture of sexual intimacy in marriage. And so as married women, we fall in this camp where sex is a good thing, where it is something we can embrace, where we can pursue, but also because of sin, I know that impacts so much of our our sex life, even in marriage. And there's a lot that we need to work through as husband and wife and different desires, struggles, things from the past. And so I know in marriage, it's not like it's all just cut and dry, black and white, like go for it. But something that I think that Bethany, you also talk a lot about is that in marriage, I think so often we place a lot of extra boundaries on what would uh be considered okay or what would even be considered godly within our marital relationship. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes these boundaries, these restrictions, they're coming from extra biblical teaching. Like it's not even things that we see in scripture. It's just things that maybe we've heard from other Christians or we've been raised in a certain line of thinking. And so we get older and we feel very trapped almost like, okay, it's like purity, purity, purity before marriage. And then you get married and it's like anything goes, but like, uh, is everything really okay? I don't know how to navigate this. There can be a lot of shame, a lot of confusion. And so I think as Christian women, we need to recognize that we we should not add more boundaries than what scripture gives us for our marital relationship, that in a marital relationship, it should be, as we see in scripture, that it is a man and a woman in a loving, 
committed covenant marriage, both pursuing one another in love, and that sexual intimacy should be a beautiful place of exploration, of pleasure, where the focus of each spouse is to serve one another. When selfishness and sin demands manipulation, when things like that enter the marriage covenant, that is not a beautiful expression of sex. And I think we just need to acknowledge that there are unbiblical, sinful ways to pursue in a marriage, to pursue sex that are not in line with God's heart for love, for kindness, for serving one another, for selflessness. Like Those are all like characteristics of love that should also be on full display in our marriage bed. It should be Mm -hmm. this mutual giving and receiving of enjoying pleasure, of giving pleasure with one another. And I know yeah. we received a lot of questions, a lot of DMs, yeah. Bethany, from married women who were saying, well, yeah. I am i don't understand, like, what about masturbation in marriage specifically? Yeah. So addressing yeah. some of the DMs that we got and, ad- and specifically addressing For masturbation sure. in marriage is something that we've never fully talked about. Yes. So I think that's where the te- definition that you mentioned at the beginning gets a little bit um, – uh, confusing when you get married, because I would say that that definition is a great definition for our single women. But when you get married, um, there is, you know, it's really like a, a team act, you know, it's like you are in this together. And that's, I love how you said we shouldn't add things to scripture because Mm -hmm. I, you know, I had a friend who messaged me and said that, you know, one of her mom's pieces of advice to her before she got married was you can have fun, but just make sure you don't have too much fun. Like somehow having too much fun sexually with your husband is like crossing a line. Mm. And I'm sure you have heard things. And so one of my favorites, Francie Winslow, she runs the podcast Heaven in Your Home. Highly recommend if you're married, but she encouraged us to ask us ask the question, who told you that? And it's basically like if you have a question about something within your marriage, like you know, this is specifically for married women. So I'm going to be a little bit blunt here. If you're single, you can kind of like pass over this part. We don't want to encourage any um, further struggle. So maybe just skip the next five minutes. Uh, But for married women, it's questions like, is oral okay? Um, Is it okay for me to um, help stimulate myself while my husband and I are together? Things like that. And in what I see in scripture, there is no boundary against those things. The scripture is very clear that things like fornication, having sex outside of marriage, adultery, having sex with someone that is not your spouse, homosexuality, lustful passions, um, coarse joking. Those are the things that scripture is against. But when you get into the book of Song of Solomon, you see a groom and a bride going to town. You know, you just see them having all sorts of fun, all sorts of exploration, all sorts of positions, all sorts of touchings, body parts everywhere. I mean, it is just left up to our own imagination interpretation. And I think Christian couples should be the ones having the most fun, being the most creative, exploring the most. When you think about it, if you say within a marriage relationship, like, okay, well, you know, this hand here, this body part here is okay. This position missionary is the godly. Like, where the heck are we getting that from? You know, really stop <laughs> and ask yourself, yeah. who told you that that's okay or not okay? Because if we go to scripture, you're going to see a lot of that stuff is just pulled out of nowhere that someone told you. Um, I heard on there's a podcast called um, Sex Chat for Christian Wives. And it's like three or four older married ladies who've been married forever. And they just, they talk about everything. And they've been super helpful in this area. And they said, within marriage, there shouldn't be any secrets. So if you are engaging in an act or doing something that your spouse yeah. does not know about, that is a huge red flag. So if you and your your spouse have a question like, okay, uh, I would like to be a part of helping stimulate myself while we're having intimacy because men are women and are different. And sometimes that can really help. Is that something that you are doing together that he knows about, that he is on board with, that you're on board with? Right. That's a discussion that you two can have, that you can be a part of. Um, you know, there's been a lot of encouragement for Christian married women within marriage to make sure they know their body, they know wh- what parts are where, they know what feels good. And that's uh, going to look different for everyone. And comfort levels in that way are going to look different for everyone. But I think the most important thing is making sure that you and your husband are communicating and you two are coming up and deciding for your ourselves what's okay for you two and what's not as long as it's not those things that we I just mentioned to you which comes from a blog post um by Julie Slattery called what's okay in the bedroom I'll link below so as long as you're not directly going against scripture bringing pornography in bringing a third person things like that if you are not lusting after another man as you're having sex stuff like that Um, then it's really, God gives a lot of freedom and that's beautiful. So instead of Mm -hmm. stressing so much in your marriage, like, is this okay? Can I put my hand here? Can he put his hand here? Can I do this? Like communicate as a couple, be prayerful about it. But I would say we need to be, um, 
less putting these extra boundaries on ourselves within marriage than not, especially in the Christian circle. Um, so that's why I have a little bit of an issue with the definition when it comes to the married couple, because I think that can add some stuff that might not actually be prohibited from scripture. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And in fact, it's interesting you say that because in the dictionary, there are two definitions for Mm. masturbation, one and two. And the second one I feel like applies more to married people because it says, so the second definition states the stimulation by manual or other means exclusive of sexual intercourse of another's genitals, especially to orgasm. And so in some ways, I feel like that could be more in line because masturbation is the stimulation of one's or of genitals to orgasm, but it could be yourself stimulating them or some other means. Um, you may not necessarily be having full-blown intercourse, um, but there is orgasm happening. And so like you said, in that place of intimacy between that man and wife, there might be moments where it's helpful for you to stimulate for the pleasure of both of you mutually. You know, men and women are built very different. The way we orgasm is very different. And so I feel like that could be more helpful where it doesn't mean it just has to be you stimulating. It could be, or it could be your husband. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're having intercourse, but the goal is orgasm, pleasure. So yeah, there's a lot of nuance. We can't address every single last thing. If you're married, our greatest encouragement would be for you to have open communication with your husband about all of this, to look at God's word together and say, is what we're pursuing in line with God's beautiful boundaries for intimacy, for purity, holiness, that also applies to marriages. Like Bethany said, we're not bringing pornography. We're not bringing other things in. It's holy and pure between the two of us. Is that what's happening? And Or are we also adding a lot of extra rules, boundaries, things that are causing a lot of fear within our intimacy that aren't actually found in scripture? Are we losing our ability to celebrate fully because we're fearful that we might be sinning in some way? Like go to the Lord together, study, learn, grow from godly, biblically-based, gospel-centered resources, people who have entire ministries based on this, and we'll link a lot of resources below. But our greatest encouragement is that you and your husband need to go to the Lord together, have open communication, continue going to the word, learning and growing, and then deciding for yourself what is most faithful for the two of you in the bedroom. Okay. You have a final word? A final word because this is, we don't have a specific resource with Girl Defined, but this has been such a passion of mine and I have only been married for four years and I've just been like, I've had so many questions and I have wanted to find like good gospel centered resources to really have like yeah. super open and honest conversations like Kristen and I have. And so I did create a resource. It's called the ultimate sex course for Christian women. And there's 11 sessions, whether you're engaged or married, this is something that I would really invite you to part be a part of. Um, We, everything that Kristen and I have talked about, we take like a thousand deep dives and learn from incredibly godly women, experts who have studied this area, who have gone through their own struggles and, and have just, they have so much to offer. So that's actually at my website, which is bethanybeal.com. I'll link it below. But if you're married, I know yeah, I mean, Kristen's been married for a long time. She's like, she's more of an expert in these ways. I've only been married for four years, but this is a resource that has been, I'm telling you, it's been so helpful for me. And I just don't want our married women to be like, okay, where are the resources? What, where, mm-hmm. what's next? Um, so you can, you can grab that. And I think that would be super helpful. <clears throat> The frogs are getting me in my throat. <laughs> but yeah, I will. We'll go through. We'll try to find as many resources as we can. Yeah. Um, and we'll link all of the most relevant podcasts because this is only the start of learning and growing. I hope that this just encourages you and spurs you on to say, wow, there is so much out there for me to learn. God does have a good design. Like, I can't wait to dig deeper. Like, I'm excited whether single or married. So we'll mm-hmm. differentiate those in the below. We'll put um, like resources for single women, resources for married women so that you can just, this can just be the start of the learning and growing and really finding freedom process. Yes, y'all. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. We know it's a sensitive one. Um, it is one that not a lot of people are talking about. So we're we're thankful that we can step into this conversation, that we can link arms together. Um, and we really hope that our new resource, the digital download, you can get it instantly. Um, the one on masturbation. So finding freedom from masturbation um, is something that we hope can be a huge blessing and encouragement to you. I know so many women have already purchased it, downloaded it, and we're, we pray that it is a really big encouragement and just offering that gospel center perspective on marriage. And then I mean, on sexual intimacy, sex in general, and then also just offering some really practical steps, eight specific practical steps that personally really helped me in my journey toward freedom. And I pray that they will be a huge help help to you and a blessing. And again, you can get that at girldefined.com slash shop. Come hang out with us over on Instagram at girldefined. We would love to continue hearing from you, hearing other questions you have that we didn't address in this specific conversation. Who knows? Maybe we'll do a part two sometime, but come dialogue with us about this. 
know it's a big topic. We have a lot. There's a lot that we can say, a lot more that we couldn't even say in this conversation. So come hang out with us over on at Instagram. And then if you appreciate the fact that we're diving into this kind of stuff and not afraid to hit on big topics here at Girl Defined on this podcast, on this show, whether you're watching or listening, would you go leave us um, a five-star review? Give us a thumbs up if you're on YouTube. Subscribe. Leave us a five-star review because that really does help other women just like you who are struggling find this resource and get the help that they need. So it takes like 10 seconds, leave us a five-star review, drop a comment. We love reading those and it encourages us. It also gives us ideas for future episodes. We would really appreciate it if you did that. And then come join us next Monday for another brand new episode of The Girl Defined Show.